I believe um, God wants to do something new in your life. God wants to take you to a next place. I still don't have time. God wants to take you to a next place. God wants to trigger something new in this new year. And we're going to kick off a series of conversations and presentations um, about the new thing that God wants to do. And this new thing is going to require you to think different. It's going to require you to be different. It's going to require you to... Um, 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 change the way you approach your life. This series is called Hustle and Flow. And when we say hustle, um, we mean grind. We mean hard work. We mean um, preparing uh, um, the soil for seed. We mean building an ark. We mean going to the gym three times a week for some of us. The hustle is the hard work. We mean fighting battles. We mean uh, I'm going back to college. We mean getting a second job if that's what you have to do. A hustle is hard work sometimes. A hustle is back-breaking work. It's difficult work. It's sometimes things that you don't want to do. I still don't have time on the clock. It's sometimes things that you don't want to do and you have to do it. That is hustling. That's difficult work. And the flow of God is the grace that God adds to you, to your grind. It's the miracle that God adds to your muscle. The grace of God is the favor that God adds to your fight. It's the sweet spot of God. It's like I'm cruising altitude. When you get to a spot where you don't use as much energy and you get much more results, the flow of God is when God adds extra to your ordinary. The flow of God is when God adds super to your natural. The flow of God is that zone where you have so much favor and things are working for you and only God could have done this. That's the flow of God. So this series is about hustle and flow. You bring the muscle, God brings the miracles. You bring the fight, God brings the favor. You bring the pace, God brings the peace. You bring the hustle, God brings the flow. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 3, we're going to consider this all through the series. The ESV says, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. In the New King James Version, it says... Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. How many of us want our thoughts to be established? How many of you want your plans for 2019 to be established? How many of you want the ideas and the decisions and the resolutions that you have made to be established in 2019? If that's your, can I see your hand? I want mine to be established. There's some things I want God to do, but it's going to be my hustle and his flow. Let us pray. Father, thank you, O God. Thank you for your word. Thank you that your word brings light and it brings life. And it changes our lives. It turns us around. It shows us what to do. Thank you that your word is truth. And this truth sets us free. I ask that the words that come out of my mouth change my life and changes the life of those, the lives of those who are here today. Thank you, O oh God, for today. Thank you for this privilege that we can worship you freely. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, on December 20th, our 10th anniversary, 10th wedding anniversary to Pastor Amby, my wife, short and sexy, thin, you see around. Um, we, we moved into our new home on our 10th anniversary. That was our gift to ourselves. I just want to say thank you to every one of you for being so kind and for blessing us, but most especially to our pastors for their generosity. Let us celebrate our pastors, Pastors Jimmy and Irene. Thank you so much. It's, it's, it's amazing to have such um, pastors that have a great heart of, of generosity. December 16th will never, will ever, forever be a date in our lives where we'd not rem- we could not imagine how incredibly loved and appreciated we are. But um, we did not plan to um, move into a house like at the beginning of the year. We did not move in. Let me tell you how much of a plan we had. We booked flights for December 24th to go to Houston to see my brother. So we're moving on the 20th and on the 24th, we leave the state. And I come back on the 30th and I see these boxes and I cringe. I'm like, I don't want to be here. I want to go back. Take me back. Because there are still boxes everywhere. And my OCD is... Yeah, I'm it's really a struggle going home because boxes are everywhere. I, it took me 30 minutes to look for socks the other day. 
You know how important socks are when you take half an hour looking for? The box is labeled socks. It's to find the box. That's, I'm venting. Just permit me. But because of how fast this, and it's not just, we, we followed some doors that God opened, but understand, this just did not happen. Pastor Ambi had an eye on our credit score the entire year. No, I'm saying, if he slipped by one point, I had a conversation. She would sit me down with one light in the middle. What did you buy? What, what, what are we doing here? Seriously. It was 7.59, now it's 7.58. I'm like, I bought mint in CVS. Why? You didn't brush that morning? No, I'm serious, it was intense. So there was some hustle to all of it, but it's just the favor of God. But ju that just meant in one week or so, we had to pack the house up. We had to pack up. It was very difficult, but we did it and we were in the house and we had some people come and help us move key. Please come, come, come up. So we, we had some people come and help us move. And one of the times when we're moving, you can stand by the table. Um, um, the, one of the guys that I paid to, to move us was helping. And then he was like, hey, uh, can you help me move the, the, the table? And so I, being the, I don't have muscles like he, or no, let's rephrase that. You don't see my muscles like you see his. He is showing off, I'm not, I'm conservative. I don't want to distract you. But, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the guy says, hey, can you help me carry some furniture? So I, I carry, and all of a sudden, I, I notice I'm the one doing the carrying. My guy is not carrying his side. So I'm like, just like, again, let's try this again. And, and, and I'm like, key. I'm, his, I'm like, hey, bro, man, like, do your part. <laughs> like, you asked me to help. At least carry something. It was a damn moment, a hard moment. I was like, I paid this guy. I don't have to carry a thing. I was like, you know what? Muscles off. <laughs> not doing this again. Tell them, go find your, your guys. Let them help you. Thank you so much. But my point is this. Most of us begin the new year and we make resolutions. We make decisions. We, make, we have dreams and we have desires and we have things that we want to do and we call God to help us carry our dreams and carry our desires and carry our decisions and we begin the year, January 1st, and we're carrying with God and somehow we drop our own part of the table. And then we leave it to God. Like, God, no, I, I, want a new, I, I, I want a new car. Go. I want a new wife. Go. I want a new job. Go. I want a new this. Go. And God is like, bro, man, cease, man. Like, seriously, do your own part. There are two sides to this equation. There are two sides. There's a side that is me. There's a side that is God. There's a side that is my dreams and my desires and my, and my, and my, and my decisions. There's a side that is God's flow and his grace and his miracle and his glory. But there's a side of our equation that we sometimes ignore altogether. And that is discipline. Discipline. Decisions are easy. Dreams come cheap. Desires are easy to have. Discipline is the sucker punch that will take you out just before you experience all God has for you. Discipline is commitment to a course of action. Discipline is dedication to a way of life. Discipline is devotion to a predetermined decision. Discipline is commitment, dedication, devotion to the hustle. Your dreams require discipline. Your desires require discipline. Your decisions require discipline. Your destiny requires discipline and devotion to your hustle. God uses hustlers. Yes. I will explain. You're like, oh, Pastor Victor, what did you say? Noah had to build the ark. Esther had to cook the food for the king. Abraham had to build the altar. Gideon was found threshing wheat when God called him. David was called from looking after sheep for his anointing service. The disciples were busy doing their job. Some of them were fishermen. Some of them were tax collectors. When God called them, God uses hustlers. God will not waste his flow on hustleless people. God will not waste his flow on, hustle, on lazy people. That's just a cool way of saying lazy people. I remember when I wrote 
medicine and surgery in my application for, for college. I did, I did not anticipate eight years of doing the same thing every day. Going to the same building, going to the same um, facility, talking to the same people, reading the same books. I had to take notes when I wanted to do it and when I did not want to do it. I, I, I had to go to class when I felt like doing it and when I did not feel like, feel like doing it. Just like some of us will have to go to the gym when you feel like doing it and when you don't feel like doing it. Some of us will have to cross that sweet, that dessert that is just there calling your name and all you can feel it in your throat, in your mouth. You can feel the warm cake already. And you just have to walk past. <laughs> Sometimes you have to wake up half an hour ahead of time because you have to read your Bible. You have to show up every day and be disciplined for the decisions that you have made. Every single day. I believe that decisions without discipline is going to lead to disappointment. Let me say that again. Decisions without discipline is going to lead to disappointment. Decisions with discipline leads to destiny. It leads to disappointment when you don't have discipline and then we blame God for failing. Oh, well, Pastor Tommy, it's going to be my year of overflow. It's not overflowing. All the pastor told you was what is available for you. If I tell you I have 500,000 in an account for you, it is yours you still have to go to the bank. You still have to show your ID. You still have to prove you're who you are. Discipline makes us into people God can trust. Discipline makes you into somebody God can trust with destiny. So your destiny is available. But are you disciplined enough to become a person who can walk in that? It's available for you. Luke chapter 9 verse 62 says this, Jesus said, no procrastination. No backwards looking, looks. You can't put God's kingdom off till tomorrow. Seize the day. If I was to write it, I would say there's no procrastination, no backward looks. You can't put your dreams and decisions off till tomorrow. Seize the day. Be disciplined every single day. Hard work is good for your soul. Hard work is good for you. Genesis 3, when man fell, just made hard work difficult. But when Adam was made, he was made to tend the garden. That is hard work. But it just became painful when man fell. So hard work is still good. But we have to have a culture of commitment. We have to have a culture of discipline. Zig Ziglar said this, it was character that got us out of bed. Commitment that moved us into action. And discipline that enabled us to follow through. Unless commitment is made... There are, there are only promises and hopes, but no plans. The only limit to your impact is your imagination and commitment. The difference between involvement, I love this, and commitment is like ham and eggs. The chicken is involved. The pig is committed. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, are you a chicken or a pig? No, look them in the face. I know you're like, are you a chicken or a pig? Are you involved in your dreams or are you committed to your dreams? Because if you're involved, you show up every now and then and lay some eggs and get on going. You show up to church once a month and lay a few eggs here and there. But if you're the pig and you're committed to your dreams and to your destiny, you're ready to die disciplined to get what God has promised you. Put your hands together and celebrate God if you believe that. We have to do what it takes to get what God has, called, has called and has prepared for us. So when you consider Proverbs chapter 16 verse 3, the Bible says, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. How many of us want our ideas to be established? I want my ideas. I have some crazy ideas. There's some things I want God to do, I want God to do this year that there is no reason why I should be dreaming that, but I'm dreaming that. And I want them to be established, but sometimes we are so keen on the establishment and fulfillment of our dream that we skip through the first part of this verse. It says, commit your works to the Lord. That word commit, the Hebrew word is galal. It means to row. 
It means to roll up. Roll up your sleeves and get to work. It means to roll, to roll away. The picture is actually captured excellently in Genesis chapter 29. Jacob goes to marry a wife and the Bible says he sees the lady coming and the animals, the sheep and the goats were coming to drink some water. And the Bible says he moved, the, he rolled the stone away from the well. That's where that word actually comes from. He rolled the stone away from the well so that the animals could drink. Now in those days, it was a dry area, arid areas, and they had to dig their wells and protect the wells. So these huge stones that were put over the wells were to avoid contamination so that the sand doesn't go in the wells, the animals don't drown in the wells, the kids don't go and play with the well because the stone was so heavy, it took like one or two men to roll it away. So it was to avoid even invaders from taking the water because you wrote your name on the stone and you covered your well with your stone. Now, now, when God says commit your work to God, he's saying there is a well on the hard work that you will not have access to if you're not willing to roll away the stone. So most of us are praying for the flow of God and God says, yes, there's a well under that stone if you're willing to roll the stone away. So when the Bible says commit your work to God, he's saying roll the stone away. Do the work it takes to access the well that God has laid out for you. Roll it away. And that word work there means product. It means Things done, labor, business, enterprise, achievements. Show God some product. Show God some discipline. Show God that he can trust you. I know, I know, some of my church folks are like, wait a minute, Pastor Victor, I know we are saved by grace, not by works, lest any man boast. What are you saying? I'm saying that in 2 Kings chapter 20, 1 to 7, Hezekiah, God had told Hezekiah he was going to die. God sent a prophet, go and tell him he is going to die. Hezekiah turns around and says to God, God, I have obeyed you. Every day I have woken up and done what you said I should do. I have glorified your name as a king. I have led the people right. I don't want to die. God says, you know what? Prophet, turn around. The prophet was still in the court. God changed his mind, turned him around. I said, go back and tell him he's going to live for 15 more years. What Hezekiah did was show God product. Show God discipline. You can trust me with more. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 14. Follow me closely. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such faith save him? Verse 17, in the same way, if it doesn't have works, if faith doesn't have works, it's dead. It is dead by itself. But some may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you, and I will show you, your, show me your faith without works and I will show you faith by my works. You see that faith was active together with works and works and by works, faith is made complete. Your discipline is evidence of the decision that you have made. If I see you wake up every morning by 4.30 to read your Bible, I don't have to guess what decision you have made. I know you want to spend time with God. If I see you come back from work as soon as work is over and you're spending time with your kid, with your wife, with your husband, with your family, I don't have to guess what decision you have made. Your discipline is showing me what decision you have made. So most of us dream and we stop in the contemplative stage of dreaming and ideation and we don't attach discipline to what we are praying for. So it is good to pray for it. It is good to have faith for it. But understand, success is not in the realm of prayer. What? <laughs> I will explain. Unbelievers are successful. You know why? They don't need, you don't need to pray to be successful. I'm gonna stay here for a while and let the tension sit. What do you mean? I'm praying for success. Success is not in the prayer realm. Wisdom is in the prayer realm. Favor is in the prayer realm. Success is not. That's in your realm. Because if God tells you to do something and you don't do it, you will not be successful. 
No matter how much you pray about it, God will tell you what to do. God will show you the open door. God will point you in the right direction. You have to pick up your legs and walk in a predetermined, favored part by yourself. <laughs> discipline, it takes discipline to commit. It takes discipline to commit to the work. Sometimes people say, give me the keys to success. Let me give you the keys to to, to, to hustle. The key to hustle is hustling. The key to hard work is hard work. There is no special recipe. Work hard. Wake up in the morning, do what you're supposed to do, no matter how you feel. Feelings are thermometers, not thermostats. Thermometers tell you what the room is. Thermostats decide what the room is. Your feelings tell you what is going on. They should not decide what happens. So check your feelings to see what is happening. God can speak to you through the way you feel. But they don't decide what is happening. You decide what to do. Every day you wake up, this is the day the Lord has made. I will. Not God will make me rejoice. No, I will rejoice. I will myself to rejoice and be glad in it. You decide what you do. It's your call. Every year God opens heavens. You have to align yourself to that open heaven. It doesn't mean you don't have faith. Faith is what opened the heavens in the first place. Faith is what got you favor. Prayer is what got you favor. But then you have to wake up, take a shower, apply some deodorant, brush your teeth, wear some clean clothes, and go for that meeting. You have to walk into the bank and get the loan yourself. You have to go back to school and continue your education. You have to do the work and be disciplined about it. God is not a genie in a box. Just rubbing Jesus' new car. Jesus, I want a Lamborghini. Honda. Jesus, I want a Lamborghini. Toyota. Jesus, I want a Lamborghini. Nissan. Jesus, I want a Lamborghini. Tesla. Um, I'll take the Tesla. Jesus, I want a Lamborghini. That's, that's not the God that we serve. Now, I, I believe the, 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 the um, record says that 40% um, of Americans make... Um, New Year's resolutions, and only 8% of them at the end of 8 of the 40% actually fulfill the New Year's resolution. January 12th is a day in the U.S., National Quitters Day. It's, it's a, go and Google it. It's a day average when people quit their New Year resolution. We are six days away per research from you quitting on all the decisions you made. Six days. The when we come on Sunday, would you have already given up on your dreams? Sunday will be the 13th. Research shows that on Saturday night, most of you will be like, you know what? Darn the gym. I, God made me perfect. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Why improve on perfection? Why? <laughs> so I've, I've made some... Go and it's interesting that most of us are not going to be among that 8%, myself included, we've made some goals. Um, one of my goals is to um, weigh less than 200 pounds for the most of the year. Not at the end of the year. For most of the year, I want to climb that scale and it says less than 200 pounds. I want to have a calmer predisposition. I'm a very intense person. Those that work with me know my P's are stronger, my D's are stronger, my consonants come out stronger, my accent doesn't help my face. My, I don't have a natural smiling face. So when you see me in the lobby, it's not that I'm frowning. When my face is resting, it doesn't rest with a smile, is what I'm trying to say. And I put that just rest, and they're like this. This is it. I have pleaded three times to the Lord, take this thorn away from me, and he refused. <laughs> but I believe that most of us fail because there are, I believe, three foundational disciplines that we do not apply to our lives. We don't take very seriously. Three foundational disciplines. That if you could hold on to these ones, 
you can build every other thing on it. So before you go and decide on what disciplines you have to go to the gym and what disciplines you have to have for food, there are three disciplines I want you to have. One is I want you to focus on God first. If you're taking notes, you want to write that down. Focus on God first. I know you'll be like, I'm in church. First Sunday of the year, I'm focusing on God. Amazing. I hear you. I feel you. I smell what you're cooking. That's amazing. But remember last year when you did not come to church because you didn't feel like you were just lazy, you snoozed 17 times, and then you just missed, and then you caught it online? I'm not dissing online, but just remember when you did that. Remember when the only time you ever sang a worship song was when you came to church? Like, during the week, you never sang it. What do you remember when you pushed your devotions from the morning to when you're on the train, and then you pushed it to when you come back from work, and you just said you do the two devotions the next day? <laughs> remember when you were told to serve, and you were like, oh my God, I don't have time. Yay. And then you were at home sitting down when the serving was going on. Remember all those times last year? Yes, that is not putting God first. This year, you have to put God first. The second thing I want you to do is um, fortify your family. No matter how successful you are, no matter how much money you make, no matter what accolades you receive, the joy of success is drained by a weak and broken home. No matter how successful you are, you have a million, million a 2,000 billion people following on Instagram. If your wife says you suck, you suck. That's, that's it. Now understand, anytime I speak here, oh my God, Pastor Victor, oh my God, Pastor Victor. Let me tell you why it looks like I'm not taking what you're saying. I will tell you why. Because of my wife. I can talk to my wife and Pastor Victor goes, I was like, babe, how was it? She goes, ah. Now, when she does that, no matter what you say, all I hear in my head is, ah. The entire week, oh my God, that was so wonderful. Ah! That's all she has to do. Ah! And it's stuck in my head. Because you're only as great as those who are closest to you say you are. You're only as strong as the strength in your family. For those of us who are single, I know it's not your immediate married family. No, even your mother and your parents and your siblings, your cousins, they decide how great you are. Because they are your unchosen support system. God picked them for you. Your friends, you picked. Your family, he picked. There must be a reason why God thought they would be the best support for you. I know you're not experiencing it now, but understand your strength starts with your family. Number three, I want you to find your friends. If you're unwilling to scrutinize your friendships, we are equally unwilling to commit to the disciplines that bring about our desires our destiny. If you're unwilling to scrutinize your friends, understand, if you are going north and your friends are going northeast, you will end up northeast. That's how it works. You must find your friend. You must focus on God first. You must fortify your family and you must find friends. Now, if I dismiss this, most of you are going to come for me in my dreams. Be like, okay, you've said all that. How do I do that? How? Okay, how? I thought I was focusing on God Apparently not. I missed one Sunday of church and all of a sudden, eh! they told me to serve and I did not serve. Eh! Oh, Pastor Victor, I'm so busy. I can't come to church today. Eh! That's all you hear me say. Oh my God. So um, I, I want to give, but I cannot give. Eh! I want to read my Bible. Oh, I was so busy. My job, I wake up by 4 a.m. I want to spend time with my family. Believe me, I love my wife. But work is just so hard. I can't really make dinner. I come back by 9 p.m. Ah! How do you put God first? Start early. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 63, I think verse 1, it says, Oh God, you are my God. And early will I seek you. Early will I seek you. Matthew 6, 33 says, seek ye first. First and most importantly, seek the kingdom of God. Seek God's way of doing things. Start early. Psalms chapter 63 verse 1. Early in the morning will I seek you. I know you have to go to work by 4 o'clock. That means you have to, your hustle is wake up by 3. Now, 
if you wake up by three, what does that mean you go to bed by eight? Why do you think God let them invent the DVR? So that you can go to bed, that way you just record it, and at your own time, you catch it up on break or during lunch, you watch Empire or Grey's Anatomy or A Million Little Things or that other one that makes everybody cry. Can't remember the name, that one. This is us. Maybe you just, that's why do you think God invented the DVR? You're welcome, wow, that's why. That's why, that way you don't stay up late, record the shows, catch it at another time. Wake up by three if you have to. Your discipline is going to reveal the decision that you have made. Don't tell me you want to spend time with God, but you actually don't make more time to spend with him. Start early, why? E.M. Bounds says this, a desire for God which cannot break the chains of sleep is a weak thing and will do but little good for God after it has indulged itself fully. The desire for God that keeps us far behind the devil and the world at the beginning of the day will never catch up. At the end of the day, the devil has smuggled and snuck rubbish into your psyche, into your mind, smuggled all kinds of bad news and negativity, and then you just plaster a verse on it and go to bed, and that negativity is still in your spirit. Start your day right. From the very beginning, the first thing, put your Bible over your phone, so that before you reach out for IG, you reach out for John, something. Start early. Start, and then number two, search wholeheartedly. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13 says this. Then with a deep longing you will seek me and require me as, as vital necessity. And you will find me when you search for me with your whole heart. Not driving and praying and showering and worshiping, worshiping or running to the train station. Father, if you let me get there, I will praise you forever and ever. Just let the train not leave. All of that divided attention is not going to work this year. IG and the Bible app. Oh, Frank wants to be your friend. Oh, Frank, so fine. You know what? Back to Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Ernest wants to be your friend. Ernest, be chocolatey. What? What are you doing? Sandra tagged you in a picture. Oh, Sandra, what are you doing? Oh, uh, Jesus, sorry. Um, be strong and courageous and do not fear. Get a physical Bible if you have to. At least there's no IG there to distract you. <laughs> you have to be intentional. You have to be intentional. Block out the distraction. Number three, I tried to make number three. Start early, seek wholeheartedly. You know, the S thing. How to get it going. But no S could work here. So number three, make church a priority. Bam, that's it. That's it. Make church a priority. Those of you are like, oh my God, he's back here again. Yes, he's back here again. I mean, pastor, what did you expect? <laughs> now, why, why should you make church a priority? Not coming to church and saying you love Jesus is like being a Redskins or Ravens fan. <laughs> and not ever seeing a game. Or saying you want to be a lawyer and you don't go to law school. Or saying you, you know how to make gumbo and you can't make roux. Understand, if you don't even know what roux is and that it has an X at the end of that word, is a French word, the X is silent. You can't make, your wife is just telling you what you want to hear. You really cannot make gumbo. <laughs> Church and Jesus are inseparable. So you can't tell me I love Jesus, but I love Jesus for myself. There is no personal Jesus. There is no personal interpretation of the Bible. Where am I going to? There is no personal, only for me. And No, no. There is always, you have your personal decision for Jesus, but the experience of Christianity is as a group. It's designed to be done with other. But that's why the Bible says we are members one of another. I didn't go here for the last first, first experience, but I, God wants you to understand you can't say you love me and you don't like my bride. Like saying, I like Pastor Victor, but Pastor Ambi, I will punch you across the face. <laughs> First of all, she's hot. Why wouldn't you like her? <laughs> well, think about it. The Bible says in Hebrews, 
Chapter 10, verse 25. Let us not neglect our church meetings as some people do. This was written to Christians. These Hebrews, they were Christians. They were Christ followers. And Paul is telling them, don't neglect. That means even Christians can decide not to come to church regularly. This is where you get hope. This is where you get encouragement, where you get a word to kickstart your week, where God releases a word, what is available for the body of Christ. This is where you get, this is where you get encouragement and accountability. People who can hold your hand up, who can hold your head up when you're discouraged, when you're depressed, when you're going through and looking for people to pray for you. This is where you find family. This is where you find friends. This is the place. I know most of you don't want to clap now. You're like, oh my, I don't want to come. But seriously, that's why God made this. So focus on God first. Then you fortify your family. How do you fortify your family? Have family devotions. I know we say it every day, but have a time when you and the rest of your family drink from the same well. You're going out to someone, have a time when you guys read your Bible. You may not be in the same room, maybe just over the phone or something, or FaceTime or something. But have a time when you drink from the same well spiritually. Because when members of a family drink from two different wells, eventually the cracks begin to show. The cracks in belief begin to show. The cracks in faith begins to show. The, the, the cracks in what we believe about God can break up a family. But when you spend some time Drinking from the same well, believing God the same way, and for the same things, God is going to release so much more. Have time to talk to your kids about Jesus with everything they see and they hear. Squeeze in some Jesus in that equation at some point. And so you don't complain about, oh, he's so stubborn. Oh, he uses foul language. Have you taught him anything? Does he know who John the Baptist is? Does he know who Joshua or Esther or Deborah is? These weird people in the Bible, does he know Zephaniah? That stuff exists in the Bible. Teach them the Bible. Teach them memory verses. Let them learn that God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of, of love and of a sound mind. I will be strong and courageous and I'm going to do, I will live and see. Give them verses that they can memorize and use for themselves. When they have bad dreams, I have the spirit of a sound mind. Give them, fortify your family. Have family devotions with them. The second way you fortify your family is by establishing FaceTime. There's a, I heard a story of a couple, I have a, 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 an image of them. They live 25 hours apart and they have a 14 hour time d d difference. But they found a way to eat breakfast together on FaceTime. Now for those of you who are in relationships and you're like, this is so sweet. Why haven't you thought about this? Why haven't you thought about this? These guys were 14 hour time difference, 25 hours apart. And they found a way to eat together. Most of us have been in the same house for one year. And you cannot remember the last time you ate dinner together. Or breakfast. Or something together. Take your face off of your phone and look into the eyes of your family members. How was your day? What are you believing God for? Are you okay? How, far, how, how can I improve? How can we improve our relationship? How, what, what, what can I change about me? What can I improve about me? What are your dreams? What are your aspirations? How can I help you? What am I doing to support you? Do you feel loved? Do you feel cared for? Do you feel like I'm here for you? Do you feel like I'm on your side? Make some time to look at the face of your family members and love on them. Forget you have a no phone zone, no electronics, no TV, no notifications. Switch the phones off and just spend time talking and looking at people's faces and build your family. Because you know what? No matter how great you think you are outside, no matter how amazing you think you are outside, if you come back and your son looks at you and does, eh, that's where you are. You are, eh. oh, he's such a great man. He's such a great, such a beautiful, wonderful man. And your kid looks at you and goes, eh. that's where you are. The summation of your life, eh. build your family. How 
do you find your friends? The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 27 verse 17, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. The Bible says in Proverbs 13 verse 20, whoever walks with the wise will become wise. I believe very much that you must find your tribe. But the first part of this year, we're going to have small groups that are accountability groups. So not only are we having 21 days of praying and fasting, that is good. That's, that's where you provoke the flow. The hustle is that you become a member of an accountability group. Go in the lobby today and sign up. Go on your i5CT app and sign up. Go online and sign up for an accountability group. They will hold you accountable for the resolutions that you have made. That's your hustle. That's your tribe. That's why we have small groups in church because you can find friendship in church. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. If you want to be iron, you have to hang out with other iron. If you find out that in your circle of friends, you're the most intelligent, you're the most accountable, you're the most mature, you're the most disciplined, you're the most grounded, you're the most everything, you're in the wrong circle. Get into circles where somebody can hold you accountable. If you don't have anyone who can tell you, shut up and sit down. No, like seriously, zip it. Sit down, you're being foolish. If you don't have that person in your life, you will self-destruct in no time. Friends are like fences. They keep you locked in on your assignment and keep distractions and detractions away from you. If your circle cannot provide a fence around you, look for a new circle. Have people who, who know what you're capable for and capable of. Who know what you will do and you will mess this year up. Who can take your credit card and cut it and you can growl and scream. You can do nothing because you know they love you. Who will change the password to your bank account on you real quick because you're spending too much. Who will call you out on your nonsense because they're holding you accountable. Find your tribe. As I end, I remember when I was in, in medical school, like I said, when I wrote down those words, medicine and surgery, I did not anticipate the level of discipline I was going to have to have. And I did not anticipate that on our fourth year, they were going to move all of us to a hostel, to an accommodation that was for only medical students. No other person was allowed to be in that hostel. Only those who you went to class with. As my fourth year, there were 50 year medical students, there were 60 year medical students, there were people that just became medical doctors. That's who you saw every day. That's who you smelled every day. That's who you walked to work, to, to, to school with, came back, ate lunch with, ate dinner with, read. So anytime you were feeling hopeless, all you had to do was look out and you would see somebody who you could talk to that understood what you were going through. That's what the church is. The church is like that hostel of people who are headed in the same direction. Who are going to hold you accountable to your hustle. Who are going to tell you that God has a flow for you that you cannot see all he's waiting on you is to act on his promises. That God has told you to rise up and walk, but you have to do the rising up and walking. For God, God has told you that he has so much more. He has a new business for you. He has a new, a new dimension for you, but you have to be ready to dominate that room when that door opens. I believe that that's what God wants for us. He wants us to put him first. He wants us to prioritize our family and he wants us to surround ourselves with the friends, with a tribe that will hold us accountable for our decisions. Let's stand up on our feet.